Next up, we have a panel that will, this, this session will synthesize and share the value and power of collaboration between Native American, African American, Latino, Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander American communities in collectively advancing racial and economic quality or equity, specifically through the joint work of the W.K. Kellogg Racial Equity Anchors. It will share how the anchors are working together to ensure a complete count of people in Census 2020 and how cross-community co collaboration can empower each community's ability to educate the general public and policymakers about the wisdom and need for pro-equity policies. To moderate this panel, it's my honor to introduce Lejeune Montgomery Tebron, President and CEO of the W.K. Kellogg Foundation. Please help me welcome her to the podium. I'm going to ask the panel members to please join me on stage. And I will introduce them once they have been seated. And while they are coming, I want to say good morning to everyone. Thank you all for allowing us to present this panel to you this morning. Um, as, I, as was said, my name is Lejeune Montgomery Tabron. And as president and CEO of the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, I'm really honored uh, to present the, this panel to you. And we will speak about the value of cross-community collaboration for Census 2020 and beyond. So why is the W.K. Kellogg Foundation so committed and honored to support uh, the work that you will hear about today? This is because in 2007, the W.K. Kellogg Foundation's Board of Trustees proclaimed the W.K. Kellogg Foundation to become, from that point forward, an anti-racist organization. Now, what did that mean in 2007? Well, we needed to get to work to understand what that meant. What we knew it meant is that we believed in one humanity and we knew that every child, every family, every person in society des deserves opportunities and deserves an equitable access to those opportunities. And so we thought about what that meant to change us inside the foundation and our operations. And then we thought very deeply about what that would mean for our programming. And one of the first things we decided to do programmatically was to support all of the organizations or a subset of organizations across the country who were working to promote uh, the same ideals that we had about racial equity across the nation. These were the policy and advocacy organizations that were on the ground supporting communities and families and ensuring that policies were those policies that allowed everyone access and opportunities. Today we call those organizations the W.K. Kellogg Foundation Racial Equity Anchor Collaboration, Collaborative. And those are all of the organizations really serving all of us, serving every person and, and really formed on the ideals of one humanity. This morning I'm going to present to you the leaders of those organizations as we talk about this work. And again, from the W.K. Kellogg Foundation's perspective, we only had two goals. One was to make sure that we could support these institutions so that they could be the best that they could be for their communities. And in that regard, we provide general operating support to these institutions so that they can do 
what they do best as well as they can. The second goal we had was that the promise of collective action could serve us well as a nation. And we knew that there was strength and unity and that the work that they were doing individually could be magnified and maybe even um, multiplied if they were to work together. And so this collaborative is going to present to you today phenomenal work that they are doing as a collaborative in the strength of all of us. And I'd like to present the panel to you. Kevin Alice, CEO of the National Congress of American Indians. Kathy Ko Chen, President and CEO of the Asian and Pacific Islander American Health Forum. Irene Kuyuan, I hope I said that right, Kuyuan, Deputy Vice President, Unidos United States. Judith Brown De De Dianis, <laughs> Executive Director, Advancement Project. Glenn Harris, President, Race Forward. Reverend Alvin Herring, Executive Director, Faith in Action. Derek Johnson, President and CEO, NAACP. Clint Odom, Senior Vice President for Policy and Executive Director of the National Urban League, Washington Bureau. And Kay Sabil Rahman, President of DEMO. Welcome, panel. I'll start with the first question. The question regarding, uh, and I will say that each panelist will take three minutes uh, to respond to these questions, but we'll get right into it. So the first question is why is a complete count related to Census 2020 critical for our communities and why and how are the nine Kellogg Racial Equity Anchor Organizations banding together to maximize the participation of our people in the census. Who wants to take this question first? Okay. <laughs> Guess I'm in the first seat, so I might as well jump right into this. So let me just say it's a, an honor to be on the stage with these folks. Thank you very much. You. So Indian country, as we know, is small. Okay, and it is really important in order to get our voice out there and be represented properly by the folks in Washington, D.C. and anywhere else in the world is to be visible. Okay, and, and, and we only get this shot every 10 years, right? Every 10 years they come out and, and count us. So any effort and any collaborative effort that, that, that gets visibility for our people is, is enormously important because as I said otherwise, we don't get heard. And so getting together and, and, and working together and being able to uh, cross-pollinate with one another, we're able to share experiences, share information, we're able, we will ultimately drive funding that comes back to us be, by, because of the fact we're no longer invisible and being able to help our important programs that keep our tribal sovereignty solid, safe, and allows our communities be, to continue to be self-determined. And, and so it's enormously uh, important to make sure that we all align with, with the other uh, groups and, 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 and folks in this country that, that, that experience the same kinds of challenges that we face and it is a powerful tool that brings us together, much like, much like what we do here at the National Congress of American Indians. Collaborative consensus efforts drive a stronger voice that brings results that impact millions of people across the country. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. 
Um, good morning. Um, I'm really honored to be here, and I just first want to say thank you to NCAI for having all of us anchors here, and that I'm so proud that the Asian Pacific Island American Health Forum, where I work, and all the anchors together have stood shoulder to, sh to shoulder with NCAI on key issues in your communities, including the mascot issue, as well as the Dakota pipeline. And for us to continue to stand together is really, really important. Um, Lejeune, just to answer your question, for me, um, data is personal. So as a child born, in, uh, born and raised in Cleveland, Ohio, but of immigrant parents, um, it was really hard to be understood uh, because English was a second language and it was hard to be heard. So it's so important to me that we all lift our voices, not only for, in my case, in the Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander communities, but really across all communities of color to really make sure that the needs and the issues in our communities are known. It's also personal because my organization was founded about 35 years ago because there was no data that said what was going on in our communities. And because there was very little data, the conclusion was that Asian Americans, there wasn't anything on Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders, but that Asian Americans were healthier than everyone else and wealthier than everybody else and you know, did better than everybody else. And that is not true. While we have certain uh, sectors of our community that are doing very well, we also have a lot of sectors of our community that aren't. And so the data is what is, allows us to be seen and for our issues to be known. So data is also very, very personal. And then despite, um, so even though our community is uh, two-thirds immigrant, we also have members in our community who have been here for five generations. And this idea that somehow all Asians and Pacific Islanders are the perpetual foreigner, we also need to show the data and the stories to say, no, we've been here for five generations, and that we have contributions that go all the way back to you know, the 1800s. And so this whole sense of, do we belong? Are we uh, welcomed here? Are we part of the welcoming you know, bodies here? And really all the anti-immigrant policies that have been coming out, especially in these days, in coming out of this administration, I'm also very proud that the anchors have stood strongly together on all the anti-immigrant policies, whether it be public charge or um, messing with DACA or the Muslim ban. And that for all of us to continue to stand together across all of our issues is so critical. It's very personal. For the last seven or so years, Many of us have been working together to improve, in fact, improve the stand data collection standards in the census, and working actually very closely with the race and ethnicity group within the Census Bureau. We almost got it done where the 2020 census would have had better data collection that would be more granular. In other words, really represent the, the even greater diversity across all of our communities, whether it be in the African American community, the Latino community, the Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander community, or in the Native and Alaska Native and American Indian communities, to really understand the various ethnicities, languages, that kind of level of demographics. It didn't get done once the, the uh, White House turned over. So, we will return to that work once all the census work is done, redistricting, et cetera, and really shoot for the 2030 census. At the same time, many of us together at this table are working together around state-based data standards. So let us turn to the states to see if we can improve the data collection standards at that level. And many of us, NAACP, Urban League, Unidas US, NCII, the Health Forum and the National Network of Arab American Communities are working on that to see how much we can also get this better data so that we can really have all of our communities seen, heard, and feel a sense of belonging. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Um, and I also likewise just quickly want to say to Kevin and to NCAI, thank you for hosting us. And it is such a privilege to be here with this panel, and it's a privilege to be with you all. Um, Glenn Harris with Race Forward, uh, and Lejeune to, to try to answer your question. I'll try not to be redundant. Both Kathy and Kevin covered, I think, some really critical pieces. But I would just name at its core 
the census is really how we measure justice, mm. right? It is a, a fundamental question of the difference between some false sense of equality that we're all stand, starting in the same place and really measuring who we are collectively, where we're at within our communities, and what we deserve. It's an equity question and a justice question at its heart. To that end, that accurate count is essential to how we think about new policy and what our communities need. It's essential for us in thinking about what are our narratives? What are the stories of who we are as a nation, as communities? Um, and how do we actually lift that up in a different way? And it's essential for the transformation of the institutions in our lives to fund un fundamentally understand who we are as communities and what it means for us to own those institutions. At Race Forward, we focus on systemic change, structural change. And to that end, I just want to name some uh, some of the hard ways that census count matters, right? It represents over $600 billion for government investments in our communities. Um, it represents how we think about voting and redistricting. Of course, it represents how we shape and form policy. It also is a fundamental way in which the business sector thinks about hiring, contracting, where investments occur in our communities. So, as a set of questions for how it matters, for how we count, who we count, it is fundamental to us actually getting to a just, equitable, multiracial democracy. And that's why us coming together, in my mind, is so essential, right? That at the core of it, we collectively, our communities, represent a multiracial majority, right? And if we bring our collective power and our collective moral authority to the needs of our communities and us collectively as a nation, we will fundamentally end up with achieving, I think, what we all hope for, which is a just, multiracial, equitable society in which we have power. Thank you. Hello, my name is Clint Odom. I'm here today representing the National Urban League, uh, a historically African-American uh, civil rights organization that provides direct services to about two million people uh, across the United States. Uh, I don't want to belabor any of the points that have been made already, but suffice it to say, a lot of what we are concerned about with the census concerns itself with funding. You've heard the number over $600 billion of federal funds that are determined by the census count. So in some ways, if you are not counted, you don't count. There, are, uh, there was a study done by uh, a university in Washington, D.C. that said an undercounting of our people represents about $1,091 each year in services that we are and our communities are entitled to. Over a 10-year period in which the decennial census uh, lasts, that's over $10,000. And if you multiply that by the large undercounting of the groups that are represented here, that's billions and billions of dollars that we're not getting. We talked about the commercial benefits of this information for hiring, for retailing, for marketing. But it's also important for things like our representation in Congress. Um, some of the gains that we've made historically in this country have been made because we've been counted. Uh, Native people were not counted in the census, as I understand it, from 1790 to 1840. African Americans in this country were only counted as three-fifths of a person because of a compromise that was struck um, in the early, uh, in, at the first constitutional convention of this country. And that failure to recognize and that failure to see has great consequences for the rights that we are entitled to. Uh, and these things are still playing out today and they remain very relevant. Um, the last thing I'd like to say uh, is why are we all here together and why are we talking to you? And it reminds me 
of a story of an, of an excerpt from one of my favorite letters uh, that has been written Dr. King when he was uh, jailed in Birmingham uh, for uh, leading a protest there, wrote a letter, uh, famously known as the Letter from a Birmingham Jail. And I think it summarizes why we are all here today. Uh, and you may know some of this already. Uh, it's, it's very widely known. It says that an injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment. Whatever affects one directly affects all, or indirectly affects all. And I think that's really the story here. And that's why we're all here and why we're looking to work with you to make sure that by 2045, when minorities make the majority of this country, that we are not relegated to politically powerless and economically powerless position. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, thanks so much, Kevin, NCII, for having us, and Lejeune and the Kellogg Foundation. It's really such a privilege to, to be here and also to be here experiencing part of uh, this convention and the gathering here uh, last night and today. Uh, my name is Sabil Rahman. I'm the president of Demos, and we're a think and do tank focused on racial equity and democracy. And as the panel has already laid out, this is such a critical time for all of us in our communities. The ability to come together uh, gives me personally just a, 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 a lot of strength and support. You know, it's uh, hard times these days and it's, I sleep a little easier at night knowing uh, that these folks and all of you are doing the great work that, uh, that is happening here. And I want to start with a little bit of a story. So I'm a Muslim American, Bangladeshi American, and um, I don't know about you all, but anytime the government knocks on our door or sends us a piece of paper, uh, we freak out a little bit, right? Um, and it's like, you know, it's a completely like baked in response. And uh, I mentioned that because it could be something as innocuous as, you know, uh, a tax return or something like that. But I, I mentioned that because part of what's at stake here with the census is, um, you know, that fear is real. And we're in a moment in the country where that fear is being deliberately stoked and weaponized. And so the Supreme Court ruled today on, on a census case. And part of why we're so worried about the census, all of us, is that, um, this notion of how important the count is for justice, for visibility, for being heard, uh, there's a deliberate attempt to make the count less than it should be, to erase many of our communities from who counts as part of this democracy. And this, there are two versions of our country that can come out of this census. One is the census that erases so many of us over the years. Um, the other is that aspirational census that actually captures a democracy that is of, for, and by the people, in which all of us are actually heard and visible and can claim our rightful share of this country and, uh, and economic opportunity. And so being able to have an accurate count is a technical piece, but it is one of those foundational pieces of building the kind of democracy that we want to build. And it's important for all the reasons that Clint and Glenn and Kathy and Kevin have already uh, laid out. Uh, but to get there, to get to that uh, inclusive, multiracial, vision of our democracy really requires all of us to lift each other up and to be in this together because individually alone where it's really hard to to go to bed at night and to and to keep keep an eye on the on the long-term future uh, one last thing that I'll say about uh, this the census thing uh, because the Supreme Court just ruled this morning I'm sure others will, will speak to it uh, in a moment but um, one of the tactics that the administration used was to try to add a citizenship question on the census. And there was some sort of pretextual reason, but part of what uh, new files have come out, come to light, showing that this was part of a deliberate strategy to increase the fear that people had about the census to make it harder for them to respond and to thus reduce the overcount. Uh, the Supreme Court just ruled this morning, uh, essentially kicking it back to the, uh, to the Commerce Department. So this, is, this fight isn't over, but it's, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic. Uh, but even with this ruling, it's so important that we all support one another to show up, to be counted, and that's why the work of this collaborative uh, remains critical over these next few months and years. Let's thank the panel. <laughs> Talking about the strength and the power of all of us, that was the most eloquent and complete explanation 
of why Census 2020 matters to this country that I've ever heard. And I've been in several meetings. But when we come together, the strength and the power of all of your thoughts makes the complete compelling explanation of why this is so important. Thank you all very much for that. And now I'd like to ask a, 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 a second and complimentary question. This question is also to our panelists on my right. Uh, based on your experience with the Kellogg Foundation's anchor institutions and the ongoing collaboration that you have, what is the value add? of sustained, systemic, cross-community collaboration when it comes to advancing racial and economic equity? Please answer uh, this question, my panel on the right. Hello, hello. Okay, yes. now. Good morning. <laughs> I'm Judith Brown Dianas, and I'm Executive Director of the National Office of Advancement Projects. We are a national multiracial racial justice organization. Um, we started off that way because we knew about the shifting demographics of America and that we really needed to be in this fight together. Um, so I want to start with a, um, a quote by um, Dr. Vincent Harding who um, is a black historian who's passed away, and he always starts off his talk saying, I am a citizen of a country that does not yet exist. And the reason he starts off that way is because there are these principles about what America and the United States is about, but we've never really lived up to those principles. And we all know that race and racism still matter in this country. And that if we think about that statement, it's really about what are we trying to build? What are we dreaming about? Can we dream together? Because as we know, the shifting demographics, the browning of America, people always say that demographics are not destiny. So my challenge to us is how do we make it destiny? How do we make sure when we are the majority that we actually have power that looks like our numbers? And why do we have to do that? Because the status quo is not working for our communities, for the people who are up here on the panel, for the communities they represent, but also for the communities that are represented in this room. And so part of the beauty of the work that we have been doing together is thinking about our common struggles and thinking about our different struggles. But how do we come together in solidarity and unity in attacking some of these barriers? So I want to give a quick little um, piece of one of the things that we did in the midterm elections. So together we worked on um, polling, on public opinion research around 18 to 24 year old voters. The reason we wanted to focus in on them was because we wanted to, we were looking at what was happening across the country and for example, the March for Our Lives. Young people were taking to the streets and saying no more, enough is enough. And so we wanted to see what is the thing that motivates young people of color. But our poll was very different from most, most polling that's done. We didn't just oversample, et cetera. We didn't just do, oh, let's do the black people, let's do the Latino people. We did all of the groups represented by the anchor groups. So we did Native American folks, we did Asian folks, Latino folks, black folks. And we did them equally across the board because we wanted to hear what they had to say. And what is interesting is that 18 to 24 year olds across all of our communities said that their number one concern was racism and racial justice. And that two, the thing that motivated them to take to the streets or to be active was police brutality across all of our communities. And that is probably because these are young people who took to the streets after Mike Brown was killed. In the moment of Black Lives Matter, young people, regardless of race, but also 
really heavily racial from our communities took to the streets because young people understood that this was a common struggle and that they wanted to be in it with each other. And so that's the kind of work that we are leaning into because we know that the America that we want to build is an America that works for all of us. And that the status quo and the structures that exist may impact us differently, but they are the things that we have to eliminate and tear down so we can see the country that we want to build and be able to live into those ideals. Thanks. Thank you, Judy. As she was talking, I was erasing what I was going to say so I can say something else. You know, race is a social construct. It was created to maintain power and control in this democracy. And so we had a juncture. We have to decide whether or not we want to create cross-community collaboration and dialogue to address the, the, the construct and push back against the power that seeks to exploit all of us, or do we do nothing and be subjected to cross-community infighting, us against us? And if you look at the current dynamics that's germinating from the White House, and we all nonpartisan here, but the policy that's germinating from there is one of racial hatred and intolerance. And it's something we need to really take close attention to, especially when you look at stuff like the Voting Rights Act, or you look at DACA, or temporary protective status, or the citizenship question on the census. All of those things were deliberately put out there as red meat to distract from the question of the power, who controls and who's going to be controlled. And then that power dynamic is about who's controlling the resources, who's controlling the labor and the cost of labor, who's controlling the public policy and the tax flow, who gets taxed and who's not taxed and how those tax dollars are spent. All of those things are important for all of our communities because when democracy is weak and capital is strong, people get exploited. And when I look at my counterparts across the nation who represent many communities, all of us are, have been victims of exploitations. Whether we grew up on reservations or, or in urban cores or in rural communities, and some of us who happen to identi self-identify as white, if you really understand the history of this nation, everybody who's considered white today, they were not cons always considered white. It's a social construct to maintain power and domination and control. So this collaboration allowed for us to break down the walls and communicate and strategize around real important policy issues that's confronting us, all of which are put out there as red meat oftentimes to distract us from what's really at stake. And through this alignment, it gives us an opportunity to begin to focus on the consequences of elections, to ensure that we maximize turnout, not to tell people how to vote, but to make sure they participate and to ensure that democracy is working for everyone. Good morning, I'm Reverend Alvin Herring of Faith in Action. Before I go any further, let me first thank the great creator, the ancestors, the elders, the young and the old people of this land, Kevin and NCIA, and the W.K. Kellogg Foundation. It's quite an honor for all of us to be here sitting with you this morning. I want to thank you for welcoming us and for hosting us. This question is a critical question not just for this moment and this morning's conversation, but this question is an important question for this nation. How shall we form ourselves as a multiracial, multi-faith, multi-ethnic democracy? And the answer is not clear. But the challenge before us could not be clearer. And the stakes could not be more important. We're here this morning. You're here in your seats. We're up here this morning because I believe we all are yearning for something better than what we presently have. And a thing, a country, a democracy that still to this day is more of a promise than a reality. So how do we get there? 
How do we make our showing up this morning? How do we make our work in our communities? How do we make our everyday lives, our love for our families and our neighborhoods and our towns and our people, how do we make that all matter? We're here to suggest to you that the way to make that matter is to not just work for you and your people to be seen, but I humbly submit that we work for all of us to be seen, that we work for a grand and more powerful union than has ever been imagined, that we work not in spite of our differences, but we work joyfully because of our differences, that we lean in and not recoil, that we stretch out our hand and not withdraw, that we cry and commiserate and not turn our back in, in indifference. That is what's required in this moment. And that is what we're trying to do here in this anchor cohort with all of these organizations together. It is challenging work and it can sometimes be perilous work. Isn't your work like that too? Isn't your work challenging? Isn't your work sometimes perilous? Don't you stay up late at night worrying about your community? Don't you sometimes shed tears for the tremendous sacrifice and the tremendous trauma that we're all experiencing in a nation that has still yet to find its way? What we have discovered in our work is that it is better to, not, it is better to work together and not alone. It's better to risk trying to develop closer bonds and collaborate together and to relax some of our own concerns for the greater good. And we know that if we're going to combat white supremacy and racism, it's going to require not just those of us of color, but we're going to have to reach across history and reach across pain and grab the hand of our white brothers and sisters as well. I sometimes describe America as a house on fire. Does that make sense to you? There's flames billowing from every room, and here we are in the midst of it. But there is a way out, and I believe only one way out, and that requires us to grab each other hand to hand and move as closely as we can, as quickly as we can to the light. I think that's what multiracial work is all about, and I think that thanks to the W.K. Kellogg Foundation and thanks to your leadership, we're able to mount uh, the good fight, and I look forward to having many more opportunities besides this to be before you and to share time with you and to spend time with you. Thank you for allowing us to be here this morning. Hi, good morning, and I'm not sure how much more I can add to all of this. Uh, I'm Irene Kuyun with Unidos US, and for those of you not familiar with our organization, we've been around for about 50 years fighting this fight of making sure that Latinos across the country um, are seen and uh, treated equally. And in the past couple of years, I, I can only extend the gratitude of my, my entire organization to this group here for being uh, standing with us shoulder to shoulder, trying to tackle some of the things that have been particularly um, targeted to our community. Uh, and without their support and their ideas and their challenges to our usual thinking, um, we may not have been able to do some of the things that we've done the past couple of years. So I just want to extend the gratitude to this group and to the Kellogg Foundation for bringing us together to make sure that we have that support and being able to lean on each other. Um, the finer point that I'll make in all of what I've heard today and what you've heard today is that it's important for us to own our narrative, um, the collective voice that we bring together. Um, for many years, uh, we've always been seen as the other, and that's probably mostly because we haven't had the opportunity or taken advantage of telling our own story. So having the data, having the, the, the space to be able to talk to each other about what matters and why we're not the other, why we contribute, uh, how we contribute, how we'll continue to be key to the success of this country is something that's very important to our community and to our organization, but it's something that we know that we share with everyone in this room. Um, and knowing that we have partners on the ground, because it's not just us here in this room, all of us work with local organizations that are putting the fight day in and day out. 
Um, we have always understood the power of working together on collaborations. Um, our organization started as seven organizations in the Southwest and it grew to what we are today. So collaboration uh, has always been our strength. We know that through the years that we've been in the civil rights fight, working with partners in this table and others has been the only way that we've gotten anything done. So um, everything that we've learned there, we continue to bring uh, along in this, in this journey and we hope to be able to continue to do this more with, with your groups um, so that we can share in this and in, in hopefully that the, the success that's ahead. Great. Thank you all. Again, I hope that we are recording this panel. It's just a remarkable panel and a reflection of a lot of very hard, passionate work that we all are a part of uh, and that is going on in our country. And I just want to point out that many times we see very negative narratives, um, but something like this is, is what the power and the possibility uh, holds for all of us in this nation. So I want to just give a round of applause to the entire panel. I notice we have a few more minutes and I do want to thank the panel. Uh, everyone, even the good Reverend Herring, stuck to the relatively three minutes time frame. Uh, we had a 15 minute cushion just for Reverend Herring. And <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> but seeing that uh, you, we have been on time, I just want, you know, as we're closing today, I just want to ask, and it doesn't have to be every panel member, but very quickly, when you look at the future and you look at the possibility of the work of this collaborative and some of the challenges that we face but the opportunities that are before us, who can just, as you know, you think in your mind, what is uh, on your mind as a potential outcome that could happen as a result of this group working together? And, and I'll quickly go down, I'll start here and go down, and if you, you can pass, but we have about 10 minutes, so uh, starting here. So, so let me just say this, um, uh, amazing group, and again, thank the foundation for this, but this has to continue, right? Yes. I mean, th this yeah. is not a one-off, yes. all right? We have 2020 around the corner, yes. but 2030 is going to be here yes. in a week, okay? And, and we really need to keep that in mind and keep boots on the ground and working forward. I mean, this collaborative effort builds strength, and, and in building strength, you know, I wrote down some notes. We learn, we share, we focus, we redirect, and, and we create a strategy and a plan that, that goes beyond the next 18 months, but will allow us to begin, you, begin to continue to learn from enough and fine tune a strategy that as we approach the next sentence, sentence, census and that one beyond, we're even, we're even more prepared to get our people out there to identify who they are, where they are, so themselves and their future generations can, can achieve and acquire what they deserve to have as equal citizens in the United States with everybody else. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kevin. So what we've been working on in the, uh, uh, we've been working together for eight years, but in particular in the last two years, we've been working on really trying to build multiracial, multiethnic coalitions at the local level so that all of our partners, affiliates, chapters, are working together so that we can really show how multiracial, multiethnic power can be built together. We did that for the uh, midterm elections, we're gonna be doing that for the census, and we will also do that for the 2020 election and then beyond. The other thing, so that's on the ground, at the level, at the national level where we all work together, we have thought deeply about Dr. King's image of the beloved community that that is what we, as Reverend Herring said, yearn for. And that what is a democracy and, and what is a multiracial democracy? And so those are the, the aspirations that we all have, not only for the work that we're gonna do in the next 18 months, but over the next decade, and that we are committed to doing together. Great, thank you. Anyone else on this side? Okay. Uh, just quickly, I will add, Yes, yes, and yes. 
to everything that folks named, we, uh, getting real about building power locally. Um, and I just want to add, you know, that we are in a moment. We all know it. We see it. Our communities are experiencing it. And that it's not new. That it happens for us uh, as a country like every 60 or 70 years, like clockwork. Because this question of what are we going to be as a multiracial democracy, it's the core of who we are. It is the original sin for us as a country. And what I believe that this coalition and our additional partners really represents is an opportunity to get this right, is to make sure in this moment that we're not handing this off to our grandkids and our kids to address 60 or 70 years from now. And that's what I'm excited about as we think about what our collective work can be. Everyone on this stage needs to be with you in North Dakota as the efforts to suppress our vote there are carried out. Every one of us needs to be on the border to protect these children whose lives are being taken, their futures are being robbed. This is our shared history in this country and we need to be, we need to be there. We need to be there when the police take the lives of our young people prematurely and for no reason. We need to, it has to be as relevant to each one of us as it is to all of us. That's the only way that a multiracial society that we've already experienced in places like California and Texas, Georgia's heading that way, Florida's headed that way. We've got little laboratories here that we can figure out how this works. But I, I cannot be unaware or uninvolved in your struggles neither can you be unaware and uninvolved in ours. They are all of ours. Thank you. Yeah, I'll just add that, um, you know, the, the things keeping us from experiencing that vision of a, of a community that is truly inclusive and based on the value of equity, a real democracy, uh, we're up against centuries worth of mm -hmm. systems that have been built deliberately to keep that vision at bay. And that's daunting, but what is truly amazing about this moment is, yes, the house is on fire, but we can build a different house. And that moment doesn't come very often. Yeah. And the only way we make sure that we build the kind of house that we want, the kind of democracy that we want, is if we are first in community with one another, second, then able to exercise power together and, and on behalf of one another and, and uh, in support of one another, and then third, so that we use that power to build a very different structure. So it's not just about the policies of today, but we're thinking about what's, what's the country going to look like in 50 years. Thank you. I'm going to quickly go down this aisle, and uh, thank you so much. Derek? So, so outcome. Outcome, if we could project forward and close our eyes and think of the date, Wednesday, January 20th, 2021, where we've done all of the hard work and we created an opportunity where we can have a proactive agenda around the policy issues that's important to all of us. And we can walk to Washington together with an agenda because the set of policymakers that are now taking the seats of power, they're doing so with our votes and our voices leading up to the process so they can hear what's important to us. And that unified agenda is not about one community or one interest. It's about all of our communities and all of our interests. And we actually have the leverage and the opportunity and the access to really hold people accountable, to make them do what they say they agree with, but actually make them do it. Great. So, um, so 2020 is coming, November. Um, really important. And I am hoping that um, we will be able to work together so that our communities see themselves in this election cycle together um, so that everyone's fight is each other's fight. Um, so that I talked about the polling, young people seeing themselves linked together um, and voting together. And the other piece is that on the other side of that is redistricting. Mm -hmm. And that's where the fight around power comes. And that's when we get to draw these lines, the political pie. The thing is that we need to make sure that our communities aren't fighting over the crumbs. 
Because our time is coming. And our time is coming to be able to expand our power. But in order to do that, we have to build relationships and think about ourselves in this fight together. And so I'm hoping on the other side of the election that we will be able to think about ourselves as being one, as our fight against structural racism and white supremacy as one fight, and that we're able to come together around a shared collective goal of what power and our country should be looking like. And I'll just add one quick thing to that. I think what we're talking about is about leadership in a multiracial community and society, right? So once we're out on the other side, that we are ready to not just think about our own individual wins, but what it takes to really build that beloved community for all of us. Um, so working with our youth and working amongst each other to be able to challenge ourselves to make sure that we are looking out for each other and that, that is leadership development. Uh, for us, for our organization, and I see that in everything that we're talking about. We met yesterday and that kept coming up. Um, that's the way to sustain this, is to make sure that, that, that we're shifting the way that we think, um, how we're going to handle the power that we have and the power that we are going to get so that we're not uh, fostering some of the mistakes that we've made in the past. I really appreciate all of that. I think to get the future that we want, we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to figure out how to turn our passion into power. Um, one of Dr. King's most important mentors, an old country preacher named Vernon Johns, once said, if you see a good fight, get in it. As you look around your community, do you see a good fight? Do you see something worth fighting for? Do you see someone worth fighting for? If you see a good fight, then I think if we want to have the future that we deserve, we're going to have to get in it. Turn our passion into power. And I think to do that, we've got to force this country to see itself through our eyes, through the eyes of people of color, through the eyes of young people, the elderly, through the eyes of those who might have a gender orientation different than our own, to the eyes of those who may have a different faith than our own. We've got to force this country to see itself through our eyes. And when it does, it will see what we see in our heart, a truly multiracial, multi-faith democracy. Thank you. We And I will close by just saying uh, I'm just so honored to be here with you and NCAI. I'm also honored to be a partner of these stellar organizations on the stage here. As a philanthropist, the only thing the Kellogg Foundation can do is lift up uh, the people and the leaders and the communities where all of this work happens. And at the Kellogg Foundation, while we're focused on the well-being of children, what we know is children are one of the most undercounted in the census across all of our children. And so we're here and standing in solidarity with this panel and with this work. And for us, this work is part of our DNA. We believe so fundamentally in leadership, community engagement, and racial equity. And we know that racial equity starts with racial healing the relationship building that has been expressed here. And that's why I'm so honored to support this work and a lot of the work that we do at the Kellogg Foundation. Thank you so much for uh, participating with us today. Thank you.